from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Our closing speaker today first came to the Library of Congress from a series of internships with the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities while earning a graduate degree in history from San Francisco State University. His time in our Digital Preservation Outreach Division, which eventually led to a full-time position, was one of his inspirations for going to library school. Since then, Thomas has held digital scholarship and digital humanities positions at Michigan State University and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. In April, he was hired as the inaugural humanities data curator at UC Santa Barbara. When he, <clears throat> sorry, <coughs> I was that kid who always got sick before the holidays, and you know, this is my holiday, so. Um, when asked in a Library Journal interview what a humanities data curator does, he described one aspect of his job as, quote, translating a researcher's individual disciplinary competencies so that, they are not, so that they have purchase in a digital environment with materials they may not be accustomed to working with. This commitment to making research, data research more accessible can be seen in his recent launch of the Sourcecaster with James Baker, which, which helps you use the command line to work through common challenges that come up when working with digital primary sources. You should check it out, it's really cool. Um, <clears throat> we've asked him to be our closing keynote speaker today to help make the future a bit more accessible too, discussing where we go from here to support data research at our organizations. Member of the Global Outlook Digital Humanities Executive Council, editor for DH Commons Journal and DH Plus Lib Data Praxis, author, speaker, and teacher on humanities data, data curation, and data information literacy, it is my pleasure to welcome Thomas Padilla. HDMI cable. Let's stand. Okay. Okay, um, so we're finally here. I, I, I would just say at the outset that I'm really honored to be um, a part of this conversation. It wasn't so long ago, um, about seven years actually, that I, I got on a plane and flew to DC with actually no job lined up, no internship lined up, purely based on wrangling um, one of the manuscript uh, curators in the manuscript division to give me a tour uh, of the stacks. And uh, it was in October. Uh, and I would like to say it was like a beautiful fall day, but it was actually pouring and, and freezing. Um, and I soaked my shoes all the way through, but luckily they still let me into the back of the stack to see you know, George Washington's uh, diary, which um, in a way kind of set me on this path. Um, so it makes it extra special that I'm actually here today. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Kate Zward and Jamie Mears and the rest of the team at the Library of Congress for putting on this event. I know from my own time here how much work goes into putting together something like this. Um, so thank you for doing what you do. This has been an awesome conversation, um, and I think it was really time for it to happen, and um, it's excellent to see the Library of Congress taking a leadership role in this space. So today I'm going to speak about three conditions, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Today I'm going to speak about three conditions of possibility that frame the way I look at the collections as data conversation. Those are agency, empowerment, and ethics. But first, I want to start with a story. Early last week, I exited the library at UC Santa Barbara, put on my sunglasses, and made my way across campus. It, it was a typical day there. It's like this basically every day. It was 72 degrees, sunny, uh, no humidity. I hope that doesn't make you, make you hate me. Um, <laughs> Uh, the quarter is just starting, so new students are out and about learning their way. You could say that it's a time of uncertainty, 
And you could also say that it's a time of possibility. I took a deep breath and I tried to clear my mind. Lots of things compete for attention. And to be honest, it's not always clear what matters, what, what really matters. It can be difficult to hold close to your heart the reason of the things you do and who you do them for. One foot in front of the other, I started to gain a measure of clarity. After near misses with bikes, longboards, um, bikes with people carrying surfboards, um, and enterprising Pokemon Go players, I reached my destination. It was a building distinguished from the rest and that it was taller, it had a tower, it's a university. We have a lot of those. Um, I entered uh, an elevator to go into the tower. The red digits flicked past to signal the passing floors. The doors opened and I stepped toward a meeting with the director of a center on campus. And I'm sure that there are folks in our respective communities walking to very similar meetings as I'm speaking. It was one of those first conversations where the pressure of possibility is everywhere. Our conversation ran a familiar course and despite a bit of variation here and there, the subtext buzzing below the surface is, it's often the same. Who are you? What do you do? And why does it matter to me, to my people? In these conversations, I often find myself um, in a sort of intelligibility and relevance bind. You know, it's like, what is a humanities data curator? You know, what are librarians for? Um, what is this digital humanities thing? And as the conversation progressed, there was a lot of academic-like hand gesturing around the table. Uh, we're, we're pretty good at that in, in a uni university land. Um, and after initial introductions, I had transitioned to open the collections as data topic, something I'm really passionate about, when the director interrupted me, took a measured breath, looked me squarely in the eyes, and asked pointedly, yes, but Thomas, what are the stakes? It's an important thing to think on, right? What are the stakes? Why are all of us here in this room? I'm sure that many of our institutions have collections that are not too dissimilar from these. Uh, in this case, it's a collection of uh, zines. Um, we could relatively easily make available the catalog data describing those collections in the way that the British Library has here. Similarly, many of us probably have works of art in our collections. Um, maybe not all of us have Van Goghs, um, but surely we have works of art. We could release um, you know, individual measurements of pixel values, you know, measuring things like brightness and hue and saturation. We could make that available. Some of us may even have things in our collections that could be used to try and make some sense of the Paris attacks that occurred earlier this year. And some of us have released data um, related to those attacks. In this case, Nick Rue, I think it was more than 10 million tweets captured as the event was happening and in the days that followed. We could do all those things, right? but, it, but it brings us back to the original question. What are the stakes? Why are we doing it? So for me, I learned to identify the stakes in architecture, which seems fitting. Like architects, we are builders. We build infrastructure in collections. We support the formation of community through these efforts. The collections as data conversation is an extension of these commitments. And though it's important so it is important to emphasize in these efforts that the conversation is not about data for data's sake or computation for computation's sake. Rather, the work is intended to build upon our commitments to support nothing less than the ability to experience life is worth living. This is not a new role for us. We have not been without imperfection in this role, um, as has been indicated by some of the presenters today. But collections as data provides an opportunity to continue to learn to do better. And so the conditions of possibility. For me, they're agency, empowerment, and ethics. 
In my perspective, the first condition in the collections as data conversation centers on agency. To see collections as data is to step toward claiming agency, to extend individual capacity to act. I acknowledge the chance of initial alienation around this framing. Data, after all, are not likely to be what the majority choose as a first conceptual frame for interacting with a book, a song, or an image. In the face of the familiar, data may seem a cold path to discovery. Yet data are vibrant with possibility. They are the product of human design and worldview. Reclamation of agency is learning how to recognize, interpret, and act upon the facets of human intention in the data. By figuring collections as data, we seek to make these facets known and usable to our communities. There is more than one path to enabling the capacity to act with data, but I'll, I'll talk about one in the interest of time. This is a path that is generally functional in orientation and depends on the notion of affordance. It's a pragmatic approach. Basically, I approach a seemingly familiar object and ask what questions, um, what functions it affords to help resolve a question. I then transition to consider what additional functions it affords if I engage it as data. Something comprised of vast numerical difference, often bound in codified systems that speak to each other across great distances of space and time. As this path is traversed, I think it's really helpful to think on Martin Mueller's reminder that every surrogate has its own query potential, which for some purposes may exceed that of the original. Now, as a physical object, a newspaper readily affords certain types of functions. You can pick it up, you can fold it, you can unfold it. Uh, I mean, you can orient yourself to a relatively significant amount of heterogeneous content in a condensed space. Once you digitize it, does this project look familiar? <laughs> Once you digitize it, the collection has become data. In the Library of Congress Chronicling America project, we see collections as data being leveraged to enhance the ability to act upon it at micro and macroscopic levels. Shifting between these scales, we witness a paradigm that extends familiar expectations for working with the source objects, the ability to browse, to search, and to read. Going back. While the platform is committed to supporting these familiar functions, the designers of Chronicling America, in a nod toward the data-centric possibilities, provisioned an API and multiple methods to get bulk access to the data. And these preparations have since supported a number of projects that explore the collection um, you know, to its fullest data extent. This was covered a bit earlier. I'm going to talk about it in a little bit more detail. Um, spurred by the recent NEH-funded contest, um, you know, this is one project. I think it, I think it won first prize uh, by Lincoln Mullen. He leveraged machine learning to identify over 866,000 quotations and verbal allusions from the Bible across 10.7 million pages of historical newspaper. Amidst nearly 56 billion words, Mullen not only identified the phenomena he was seeking, but further augmented the data by creating new linkages between it, indicating not only when and where Bible verses occurred, but also discerning and subsequently explicitly structuring the data so that they indicate how often verses tended to occur together. This act sheds a more complex view on use of the Bible to support the formation of our varied imagined communities over time. Of course, our collections are not limited to surrogates of physical objects. Increasingly, we collect so-called born digital data. Web archive collections are significant efforts here at the Library of Congress, the Internet Archive, and throughout the world, institutions large and small. A key component of the data orientation with respect to these collections is learning how to recognize what their nature affords for supporting exploration of questions. It will continue to be the case that we will have users that want to interact with these archives as a user may have interacted with them at the time of their creation in a web browser, on a mobile device, and so forth. Yet if we peel back the layer to engage the underlying, less visible structures organizing the representation we see on the screen, it becomes possible to ask more questions. Consider Ian Milligan's work on Canadian political parties and interest groups. In this network visualization, Milligan has drawn connections 
between all links that crisscross Canadian political parties and interest group websites. From this vantage point, Milligan gains a sense of topology in the data, a multidimensional view of connectivity that may have not been readily apparent and or intelligible without an awareness of the possibility latent in the data sitting below the surface of the familiar. This push toward reaching past our familiar orientation to digital environments is what the collections as data conversation is all about. The deeper we go down this path, the better we serve our community's ability to peel back the layers covering seemingly mundane interactions in everyday life in order to recover an ability to act. Empowerment. In order to do the work that lies ahead, we will need to be empowered to think differently. When I say we, I am referring to the builders at cultural heritage institutions, large and small. When I say that we must be empowered, I refer to the concept in its truest sense as a move towards self-actualization. I'll speak now from the perspective of libraries in particular, since that is the community I have the most familiarity with. There is a base claim to universality often touted in libraries universal collections with impartial aims, services with universal scope. In this manner, libraries are figured like transaction-driven, benevolent black boxes. But seriously, I would say down with the black box. Libraries are people. Individual hands, hopes, and dreams build the collections we use. Let's acknowledge that, celebrate it, and give credit where credit is due. Collections as data provide an opportunity. Who designed the schema? Who did the transcription? Who decided why the acquisition should be made and for whom? Why did a certain normalization occur? This is about recognizing the labor and the intellectual value of librarian contributions to crafting the materials with which a wide array of communities gain a sense of meaning in the world. It is also about surfacing the design decisions underlying these collections in order to give them their fullest integrity so that they can actually be used to substantiate claims that are based on them. There are many directions the Collections as Data project could go. In almost any direction, we will bump into pre-existing norms for going about this work. And there will undoubtedly be expectations couched in terms of scalability. Here are the chickens, if anyone was following on Twitter. There's actually only two slides with chickens, so I apologize if the expectations were raised. Um, but the scalability question, that framing. Um, to be honest, I'm, I'm a little bit tired of scalability. Um, it's like a chicken or the egg debate, where someone keeps insisting that chickens sprang from an ur chicken forehead and won't consider the possibility of the egg that both could actually happen in parallel, that they might actually need to happen that way in order to push the conversation forward in this space. Sidebar, uh, I want to thank Katie Rawson and Trevor Munoz, who in their piece um, Against Cleaning, from their Curating the Menus project, they introduced me to Anna Singh, who I'm just going to quote here on the next three slides, um, because she really captures this notion of scalability that I'm trying to get at. Highly recommend her piece as well. So when small projects become big without changing the nature of the project, we call that design feature scalability. Now scalability is possible only if project elements do not form transformative relationships that might change the project. And here's the kicker. But transformative relationships are the medium for the emergence of diversity. Tying it all together um, from what I would consider a, a classic piece, although it's probably only four or five years old. Um, it's a talk that Bethany Navisky gave, uh, a skunk in the library, you know, kind of writing on digital library work or speaking on it. She had said, if you want unusual results, you can't expect that they will come from playing by the usual rules. A couple of issues typically arise as librarians aim to extend their commitments in the collections as data space. First, it is often expected that new ground is broken, yet the potential of the work is mitigated from the outset 
by attempting to predicate effort on a scalability paradigm. Scalability cannot be the sole precondition of possibility in the collections as data space. In order for diverse solutions to occur, we must learn to embrace experimentation that accommodates and even embraces the value of failure as equally as success. Some may say that the ability to engage in the span of outcomes constitutes a luxury, a privileged position. I would say to look to liberal arts colleges, oftentimes dwarfed by their R1 research universities, uh, peers throughout the country. They are doing some of the most interesting work in this space and with vastly limited resources comparatively. The second issue impeding forward progress relates to time. As previously mentioned, it is often the case that there is an expectation that new ground is broken, but little is done administratively to free up individual time to contribute to new projects. I find more often than not that personal interest or excitement what you might call the preconditions of empowerment, are not the barrier to doing collections as data work. Rather, it's simply a question of time whose lack of resolution can often be traced to administrative mismatch between goals and reality. Simply put, let's free people up to empower themselves in their work, whether that's collections as data work or some other new initiative. Now, I've long admired the work that Cooper Hewitt has done with collections as data. They are enthusiastic and very public about their experiments. They actually have a menu on their website called Toys with an experiment section. There are currently four experiments uh, listed there. They're all disabled. Does this mean they failed? Could we consider the possibility that they may have been meant to fail? That they may actually be a good thing, these failures. As we move out of the experimental section of the toys menu to the exploration menu, we are presented with a dizzying array of ways to engage the collection. Search by color, you got it. Search by concordance, why not? I don't know with 100% certainty, but I'd bet that more than one of these features started in the mind of someone who felt empowered to explore. That exploration was run as an experiment, disabled, and then walked into the primary collection interface. On this slide, we witness one of these experiments in action. What we were seeing is a, is a really novel solution um, to address, addressing uh, a particularly challenging problem. Essentially, they're trying to deal with um, uh, differing scale between objects in a collection and the challenge of how to generate thumbnails that convey an equivalent amount of information to the user, right? So if you took a picture of a chair uh, you know, from a distance of five feet and maybe a pencil from you know, uh, eight inches above, how do you create like, equivalent thumbnails that help a user make a, de a decision, right? So one of the things that they did in the labs is they wrote a Python script to generate um, Shannon entropy values for each image in order to inform which part of the image would actually be cropped so that it would convey the most information. The British Library Labs has been doing fantastic work in this space for years now. Folks like Nora McGregor, um, Mia Ridge, formerly James Baker, um, they've I feel like they've kind of been eating everyone's lunch a little bit, especially in the National Library space. Sorry, Library of Congress. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're an enterprising group. They engage in teaching digital scholarship within their institution, and uh, they work toward releasing a whole slew of different types of collections as data. You may have heard of their pioneering work, automatically extracting a million images from historical text and making them available via Flickr under a CC0 license. Subsequently, they have encouraged a number of competitions for working with the collections that they release as data. These efforts are not purely about publicity. They provide opportunities to refine the way that we prepare and provide access to collections and can lead to concrete reciprocal benefits from outside our institutions. For example, uh, in this case, Mario Klinkemann's experimentation with machine learning and semi-automated image classification to generate additional metadata for the Flickr release and also to enable subsetting by you know, really sort of interesting features, like all of a sudden it becomes possible to subset the collection by portraits. It's kind of cool. I'm not sure exactly what the application would be, but it's kind of a cool functionality to enable. 
Um, there are a number of libraries in North America that have been working in this space as well. Um, I'm formerly of Michigan State University. Um, for those of you not working in the Big Ten or fans of college football, that's the, the green helmet up there on the left. Um, while our collections across the board here differed in scope, we all shared in common a desire to explore releasing our collections as data in order to encourage additional types of use. The process in my case, <clears throat> excuse me, was fairly straightforward. Identifying existing digital special collections, evaluate the possibilities latent in the data. Are they unstructured? Are they structured? What is the quality of the OCR? Has it been transcribed? Has it been hand transcribed? How representative is the data given its um, relationship to the totality of the collection? The next step was to create derivatives that served anticipated use. So out with the JPEG thumbnails, in with the PDFs, the TI encoded files, the plain text derivatives. Wrap all of the above in new documentation that is geared towards supporting computational use. Now subsequently, this data was used to support digital humanities pedagogy, became a test set in a text analysis program, and was sought after to support a computational analysis <clears throat> of ingredient usage in cooking throughout American history. Had we not treated this collection as data and promoted it as such, it's not likely that it would have seen these types of use. A work of this kind only becomes possible when individual people feel empowered to pursue their passions, to self-actualize through them. The cost of that self-actualization is time and the confidence to pursue projects whether they succeed or fail. Really, failure should be a goal, I think. That said, embracing failure doesn't mean doing our work without attention to ethics. We must commit to transparency, inclusivity, and respect in the work that lies ahead. A number of ethical considerations are raised in this space. Some of these are new, others are familiar, but possibly more complex in light of the medium. The first issue relates to <clears throat> transparency in the process of collection building. How were the data processed? What was left in? What was left out? Why? How representative is the data? What bias does our organization of the data reflect? Can we admit a bias? I think for a number of reasons that data-driven journalism has some qualities that we can learn from as we consider these questions. Recently, journalists at BuzzFeed supplemented an article, New American Slavery, shown here, with a blog post that links to data, methods, analysis, and code used to produce the work. We see that the level of transparency is quite granular. The writers go down to the level of individual claims in their narrative text with links to the IPython notebook that contains the code that generated the data to support that particular claim. As I cast my eye over this approach, I wonder what it can teach us in libraries as we work to provide collections as data. Will our users expect similar levels of transparency in the documentation of computational processes and analytic decisions that were made to generate the collections that we provide access to. They may. Transparency in this vein may actually be a precondition of viable use. As collections as data are developed, we cannot lose sight of interest beyond North American borders. We must have an inclusive vision, global outlook digital humanities, affectionately referred to as GoDH, reminds us of this pointedly. There is a wider world to engage with. We should think deeply about how we can best interact. Part of that consideration is linguistic. Part of that consideration speaks to questioning assumptions of normative access to computational infrastructure. Through GoDH's experiments with minimal computing, we can discern a model for encouraging participation in this collections as data conversation that is more expansive than it would be otherwise. Across the board, we require acts of bravery, large and small, to make our collections as open as possible. Few things make the light of curiosity die more quickly in someone's eyes when they shift to the words, rights assessment is your responsibility. <laughs> I've experienced this myself. This is something I've witnessed personally from primary school teachers uh, when I worked in education outreach here at the Library of Congress. 
um, to researchers interested in large-scale text analysis in the various universities that I've worked at. NYPL, I would argue, is just a shining light in this space that I'm very grateful for. More open collections equal more access, which in turn equal a more inclusive range of use. Now, this is important. Collections as data represent lived experience, and we should respect that. Traces of human activity are not butterflies to be collected, cataloged, and pinned in 21st century cabinets of curiosity. Documenting the now focuses on capturing a liminal form of data, our tweets. While the technical development is impressive, it also presents an approach that models how we might engage in collections as data activity that is expressly predicated on sustained attempts to ground the act of collection in community need. Documenting the now approaches this angle of work in a number of different ways, but I'm particularly intrigued by Burgess Jewell's attempt to map precedent in archival practice codified in the deed of gift to gain a measure of purchase over the challenges that lay ahead, particularly as they pertain to structuring agreements between data producers and data collectors. I hope we see more efforts like this in this space. A contract, after all, is about agreeing on the terms of engagement. It's about mutual respect. In her interview with the LA Review of Books, Jessica Marie Johnson hits upon one of the key failings of our collections, their inclusivity and their representativeness. She, like many others, have by necessity sought meaning in the fragments and absences in archival holdings that testify to practices of systematic bias whose net effect is nothing less than an attempt at historical erasure. Sometimes it is the case that the histories are buried beneath a homogenized approach to representing our collections. Seeing collections as data offers an opportunity to surface difference in the historical record. In the case of the real face of white Australia, Tim Sherat leveraged a facial detection script to automatically extract faces from a wide range of historical documents and place those front and center to give people primacy. In doing so, Sherat utilized a data-oriented approach to humanize the data and surface a story that might have been otherwise told. As we transition our historical sources to meet the collections as data mark, we must be conscious of the extent to which the bulk of the digitized historical record privileges white, English language, predominantly Western history. This is a legacy born of early 20th century microfilm collection development policies. Subsequently, many digital projects have worked from these data sources, which biases said projects toward reinforcing a less pluralistic view of the world. Presently, we have an opportunity to create collections as data that better support the ability to craft narratives that reflect a greater diversity of lived realities. Jarrett Drake reminds us that we all are complicit in the creation of collections that reinforce inequity. In order to improve, we must face that reality, really look at it, and aim to do better. As I have mentioned throughout this talk, collections as data provides an opportunity to do better. There is some initial concerted effort seeking to improve our work in this space. The Digital Library Federation Cultural Assessment Group is one promising start. It's early on, but they're expressly geared toward identifying and questioning the underlying biases that are driving digital library collection development. You may have noticed throughout this talk that I, I didn't talk much about infrastructure with any degree of specificity, um, or really anything particularly technical in nature. Uh, it wasn't my goal um, to do so. That said, I wish it went without saying, but I, felt, I, I feel I need to say it anyways. Any infrastructure we develop to push the collections as data conversation forward must take place in an environment that recognizes and works against historic and contemporary hostility toward women, people of color, 
and other underrepresented groups. And we come full circle. There's an incredible amount of opportunity that lies ahead. If we stay true to supporting the agency of our communities as they seek to make meaning from the data, if we empower ourselves to be inspired by our own experiments with data, and if we are guided by an ethics that focuses on transparency, inclusivity, and respect, I truly believe that we are heading in a promising direction, a direction whose path charts a course to nothing less than supporting life is worth living. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.